Okay, this. Ah. Ah. Finally, the tech's back at the tech conference. <laughs> I was just about to say hello to everyone. And the title of our session today is Who Gets to Become an Entrepreneur? Um, how do we create a meaningful mandate for a diverse workplace? And I'm happy to present you a very diverse panel here. And um, the first one I'd like to introduce is Sean Case. She's, uh, before co-founding the Case Foundation, she was a senior executive a at AOL. She's been decades working for the tech industry, so she's kind of an expert in this field as well. She's chairwoman of the National Geographic Society Board of Trustees, and she also serves on the board of the Accelerator Brain Cancer Cure. And she was advisor to the U.S. National Advisory Board to Social Impact Investing Task Force, established by the G8. Sean and her husband Steve joined the Giving Batch in 2010. Shelley Porges is Managing Director of Reservoir Q Global, an advisory and investment firm. She's also the president of the North American Jury for the Cotier's Women's Initiative Awards, a member of the board of the Global Banking Alliance for Women, and on the advisory board for Cornerstone Capital. Um, and uh, she's also an expert on call for Georgetown's University Entrepreneurship Program. So, as we like to have a diverse panel, we do have two male participants as well. <laughs> <laughs> Dale Stevens, he's author of the book Belonging at Work, and he's an advisor at Roycoy. Dale's goal is to make the workplace a more diverse and inclusive place for everyone. Previously, he founded yearncollege.org and wrote Hacking Your Education. Stephen Frost, to my right, leads Frost Included, and he's a, it's an inclusive leadership practice. <coughs> Previously, he has been head of DNI for KPNG and for the London Olympic and Paralympic Games in 2012. He teaches at Harvard and Sciences Po and is advisor to the British government and the Inter International Paralympic Committee. And he's also author of uh, some books with titles like The Inclusion Imperative or Inclusive Talent Management. So welcome to everyone. Thank you. I'd like to start off with a personal question to each of you. All of us are white. At least there's some men and women on the panel, but I'd like to I would dare to say that all of us come from a privileged background. So nonetheless, we're talking about diversity. There must have been a moment in your life where you realized that diversity really matters. When was it, Sean? And, and if we sure. Um, well, I was raised by a single mom, actually, mm -hmm. out of a working class background. And I, early in my life, thought I wanted to become a lawyer. And so I was provided a mentor who was a judge who went on to become a mayor, who went on to become a congressman in the United States. But when I was put in his office to basically do internship work during my high school years, when I walked through the door, I realized that was the first professional office I'd ever been in in my life. I had no idea how that other world worked. I'd been in a working class neighborhood with working class parents and grandparents, et cetera. And so there were just, it was immediately clear to me that there were two worlds and probably more than two. One that had been completely unknown to me before sort of I was brought into it. Um, and I think that was a coin dropping moment for me. I realized that, you know, empowerment is a very real thing and it comes through opportunity and opportunity is not universal. Um, and I think that probably played some role as well as, you know, sort of the way I was raised with the belief that we all need to do what we can to provide shared opportunity and prosperity. Hmm. Steve, um, you're an advisor for diversity. What made you, what made you dig into that topic so far? Well, I, get, I guess a couple of reasons, uh, Andrea. W one would be personal. So I think anybody that's had experience of being an outsider uh, can kind of empathize with other people who've been outsider. So my moment, like yours, was first day at university when, you know, you think, wow, I'm really privileged to be here. And in a very British way, people say, where are you from? Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, from Yorkshire in the north. And he said, oh, God, that's miles away and walked off, you know, because it wasn't the right. Okay. So welcome to the British class system. Um, but I think there's the personal motivations, um, being gay, being northern, being different social background 
but the intellectual or commercial uh, motivations are really apparent today. And, and that is that, you know, I work with some amazing people, some brilliant, intelligent people who can be the best at what they do. But if they're all cut from the same cloth, then brilliant people can make really dumb decisions. Mm -hmm. And so actually the, the commercial, the intellectual motivation for what I do is that um, smart people need very different smart people to continue to make good decisions. And often they're the people that least realize it. Mm -hmm. Shelley, you're from a financial background. Um, do you have a financial perspective on the topic diversity? Well, I think that uh, just like we like to say everything uh, that happens in the economy is political. Everything that happens in our world has some kind of financial and economic implication. But, you know, I had the privilege of working for Hillary Clinton when she was Secretary of State. I was her senior advisor for global entrepreneurship after having had an entrepreneurial career myself in the San Francisco Bay Area for 18 years where I founded or co-founded six companies. And um, the one realization I came to when I worked for Hillary at the State Department, I always th you know, think of it in this way. Imagine if Steve Case or Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg or Steve Jobs, some of the greatest innovators of our time, had been born in Asia or Africa or Latin America. Do you think they would have realized their potential? Or imagine if each of these amazing creators had a sister or a wife who is equally innovative, equally brilliant, equally determined, equally resourceful. Do you think she would have the opportunity to fulfill her potential? Secretary Clinton always said, talent is universal, but opportunity is not very much echoing what Jean just said. And I think that encompassed for me um, an approach and a thought process about geographic diversity as well as gender diversity. However, on a more personal note, I tied back to when I you know, started my first company. When I was growing up, so I was a child of immigrants. I am an immigrant, actually, to the US. I came to the US when I was five. My parents were refugees from Nazi Europe, who ended up in pre-Israel Palestine. I was born in Israel. We came to the country when I was five. My parents had not gone to college in the US, had not had so many of the background things to offer me, but I did get to go to an Ivy League university for both my degrees. Um, but while I was growing up, my dad was a small business person. He started several businesses. And what was ironic in retrospect, is my dad tried desperately to get my older brother interested in business. Desperately. So many different ways, I won't go into it here. Never once asking me, thinking of me, engaging me. The only did one good thing he did around that, and it wasn't because he didn't love me. I know he loved me. He did teach me math in my head. But years later, of course, my brother became a fairly successful filmmaker. And I was the one who became the businesswoman and entrepreneur. <laughs> and when I think back on what advantages I might have had, if only in how to think about it, if only to understand the challenges I'd be facing, uh, especially in the first round of being an entrepreneur. By later on, you get it. Um, I think that was, I, that was when I reflected back on that and how, though my dad loved me and I, of course, adored him, that that was a real fundamental difference in how, uh, you know, and, and a real point of difference in terms of, you know, gender bias that's not intended as gender bias, but simply it's just how we live our lives. So. Mm -hmm. Dale, why did you choose as a topic of your book diversity or this the workplace diversity? I was born into the first generation of gay men in the States at least that never really had to worry about um, whether or not marriage would, would be legal. Um, and growing up in that context, it became more and more clear that being an ally as a cisgendered, white, privileged male uh, was more and more important. Um, And I think as we, as we look to history, uh, civil rights battles are successful when people build bridges across, um, uh, across different, different fights. Um, and to some extent, uh, the fight for marriage became very, very siloed. Um, and uh, it, it seems like if we're going to be successful in, the, in history writ large, um, being an ally and an advocate using the power that I have as a privileged white male is more important than ever. Hmm. Since we're here at a tech conference and um, 
tech is, um, has been described often in the recent weeks and months as a especially um, difficult workplace for women, for um, um, people from other backgrounds or other um, 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 religions. Um, Sean, you have been working in tech for so long. Um, what do you think are the reasons why is this industry so difficult to deal with that problem? Yeah, well, I think tech has gone through a couple of generations, and the generation that you know I began in in tech uh, was really before there was the internet. And I worked for the first online service in the United States before I went on when AOL got started. Um, at that time, the culture was not hostile to women. My experience very much was that I was a peer at the table, um, and I didn't feel sort of that bro-ish thing that we know has taken over Silicon Valley today. And when I spend time with young people, whether they be people working in tech companies or entrepreneurs who are building them, you know, it really is a new thing. And I think there, you know, there's a lot of discussion around what has created that culture. You know, I think one thing is the big have gotten really bigger, and when the only focus is on growth, 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 perhaps the values in the workplace take a back seat. I think we've seen that at Uber, for instance, where it was all about growth, and if you were producing the growth, it mattered less what bad things you might be doing on this side. I also think the elite culture, uh, it really has become a very consolidated, almost condensed uh, realm now of where capital flows. And I'll give you some data. Uh, last year in the United States, 90% of venture capital went to men, leaving only 10% for females. And as someone who spends, like many of you on the panel, a tremendous amount of time out in the field, it is not for a shortage of female entrepreneurs. It is cultural, it is entrenched, it is implicit bias in many cases. Only 1% of venture capital went to African-American founders. So, you know, where sort of the, the power base is that's defining where the new tech is going uh, is too concentrated, it isn't diverse enough, and it's creating these cultures in these new tech firms, which is not healthy. Mm. Steve, uh, do you, if you are advising companies um, when it comes to diversity, what what is your advice to them? How can they change the atmosphere? Sure. I build on what Sean said. I mean, f for me, let me answer that in a couple of ways. F first of all, what what are we dealing with? And when I look at tech companies, you've kind of got three buckets. You've got some that I'd call diversity 101, mm -hmm. who fundamentally do this stuff because they have to. Mm -hmm. But beyond all the hype, it's because of regulation, uh, regulation only. There's a second bucket that I call Diversity 2.0. And they're companies that are doing it because it makes them look good. It's marketing, it's stakeholder relationships, and so forth. Now, compliance and marketing have a role. They're good, but they're insufficient. There's a third bucket, which is still far too few tech companies, which is doing it because it you know, makes for better decisions. Mm -hmm. But actually, you know, when you talk to guys in tech, you know, publicly they might say, oh, it's really important, but privately you've got the bro culture. But actually when you get them to talk openly, privately, they'll admit to being on occasion stressed, overwhelmed, out of their depth, and so forth. And so you say to them, well, you've got two choices. You can either train your own brain to deal with this. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's face it, the, the amount of information we have to process is doubling every two years. So unless you're Einstein, or even if you are Einstein, you can't really process everything you need to do to make a good decision in your own head. So you either train your own brain to see your own blind spots, calibrate your own thinking, and that's possible, but very hard. Or you surround yourself with as much difference as you can handle and let them do it for you. Mm -hmm. So if you actually see people who think differently, come from a different background, have a different gender, a different ethnicity, as actually covering your own blind spots, calibrating your own thinking, stopping you making monumental risks. Wow, suddenly diversity goes from being a charitable, almost patronizing initiative I have to do to get more women or get more black folks to actually, in my own enlightened self-interest, as to how I can help myself make better decisions and keep myself out of jail. Mm. So what I'd say to folks in terms of advising them is this is not about them, this is about you. And this is about your leadership capacity and potential to make better decisions. 
And unless you're very arrogant or Einstein plus, you need diversity more than it needs you. And I think that humility can help you make better decisions. And reframing it as a leadership concept is what I find gets all the guys on board more effectively than other approaches. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Shelley, um, Steve just said that diversity um, has a lot of advantages for the companies as such. Do you think that the companies have realized the potential they, this topic has? Well, you know, actually there's a lot of research that demonstrates that companies with diverse teams and diverse boards have much higher returns and you can, you know, turn to everything from the GEM study to McKinsey and others. But from an investor's point of view, there's also the aspect, since we're talking about, you know, men are most of the investors, sadly, still today. Uh, it's growing very slowly, uh, that there are more and more women, but uh, uh, a number of recent studies are now emerging that shows that diverse teams, diverse founding teams, are actually have much better ROI. And a specific research that just came out a couple of weeks ago among five, 300 early stage companies uh, showed that diverse teams, women, uh, uh, teams with specifically with women on them, now there's the diversity element of ethnicity, which is also critical, but with women on them, had 63% higher return, 63. So if you're an investor, as you're saying, it's not just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. And yet, uh, you know, when we talk about who gets to be an entrepreneur, it's not necessarily the ones who have the best ideas. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily the ones who are returning the best returns. It's the ones who have the best access to the networks. And there's a whole lot of research on that. But coming back to the returns, uh, in addition to 63% higher ROI that diverse teams are getting, this study found that the top 10 out of the 300 companies in this sample were all diverse teams. Not a single one was a male-only team. So um, yes, it, it's a leadership thing for sure, but it's a smart way to run your business. It's a smart way to run your business for best returns. It's a smart way for investors to consider. And um, hopefully, um, as we have more and more um, visionary investors, both men and women, uh, we will you know, see some of that changing. Yeah, I want to pick up on what Steve and Shelley said. I mean, really, at the end of the day, I think that's um, the best argument to bring to the investor world, which is, you know, we're kind of leaving innovation on the table mm -hmm. because diverse entrepreneurs will bring more diverse solutions than we're seeing in the market today. And when you think about the world, even if you limited it to just one country, there's great needs throughout that are completely unmet by technology or new innovations today. We need to pull from those communities and encourage those innovators to build new companies too. You know, we, we love things like Uber, but frankly, that's just more comfort for people who already had plenty of comfort and convenience. We really need to pull from segments of society that Silicon Valley or, you know, Brooklyn aren't necessarily thinking about. Yeah. And can so I give you just one example yeah. of a current company I'm very excited about that, you know, everybody probably in this audience, I assume, knows about WeWork or other shared uh, mm -hmm. working spaces and what they're doing. And their motto, of course, is we uh, work to live, not live to work, uh, which is very nice. But what they're not doing is the thing that this new company is doing, and that is they're, they're putting together uh, shared working spaces with daycare mm -hmm. for parents in the gig economy. Mm -hmm. Because in, in most of our Western societies, at least, where we don't have extended families to take care of the kids, when, when a young gig worker, when a, you know, whatever your role may be in the gig economy, you're on your own and or you mm -hmm. maybe have two or three co-founders, um, uh, you know, you become a parent. Where do you go? And m for the most part, so this young architect that I met not very long, just a few weeks ago, actually, and I immediately jumped on because I thought this is a brilliant idea. She actually went to WeWork and they thought, no, thanks, we don't want to do that. Wow. I'm saying I, 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 I wouldn't be surprised if the idea emerges eventually and gets sold. But meanwhile, we're moving ahead rapidly and trying to find her financing mm -hmm. and investments so I was just she can grow this. I just about uh, going to ask which solutions we could propose. So, Shelley, you have already proposed yeah, one and solution. Yeah, and I think that's one that will benefit men, too, because, of course, sure. we have men who are parents and will benefit as well sure. from having, you know, apart not only daycare, but their kids in their same location. Apart, right. from, apart from daycare, yeah. Dale, what other tools, what other suggestions could we bring up to um, bring in to companies, uh, people from more diverse backgrounds? What do you think? 
What, so well, one of the reasons that companies engage with Roycoy is that it provides a, a solution to actually build a, a very diverse pipeline of talent that uh, unlocks diversity in a company's own existing network. Um, and I, I think one of the key things that, that we've seen is that the interest in diversity and leadership really has to come from the top. Mm -hmm. um, unless the CEO or the CTO is engaged and really cares about the problem, um, it's written off, like Steve was saying, as something that you have to do or need to do rather than something that's imperative to the business because uh, teams make better choices, because the returns are higher, because you can increase margins. Um, and so it's, it's exciting to see tools like Roycoy, like Jopwell, um, that are being funded uh, that actually help companies both hire diverse talent, but also uh, elevate and promote diverse talent internally uh, once it's there. Uh, because you can't, you can't have a one-size-fits-all so solution. Um, and just getting, just getting diverse talent in the door does not solve the problem. You have to make sure that you have an inclusive and safe environment so that your talent continues to grow uh, and elevate over the course of time. Hmm. I mean, See if you want to add. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think really building on what I'm just been said, I think practically, you know, companies, if they're serious about this from the top, I've got to do two things. Uh, one is the kind of unconscious nudges. So the kind of platforms you're describing, you know, to actually shift behavior unconsciously. So 97% of our thinking is unconscious. How can you shift that? For example, if you recruit in teams rather than one-on-one, -on -one, you will choose more diversity unconsciously. People are very unlikely to hire five white guys in one go or five women in one go. They're going to unconsciously think about difference in hiring a team. But we still persist with hiring one-on-one. -on -one. So nudges like hiring in teams can really work. Mm -hmm. Other nudges can be really simple, like how you write a JD or the kind of things you, you put in there at the moment the decision's made. So a bunch of unconscious nudges, and we can help you know, de-bias loads of systems like that. The second thing that companies have got to do is conscious leadership behavioral change, starting from the top. And that's really taking leaders through four things. One is holding up the mirror, so actually looking at the data to actually realize the lack of diversity. Because people often think it's better than it is, because they don't actually look in the mirror. Second is then reframing this as a leadership issue. Again, it's not about them, it's about you and your own leadership style. Three, then it's about being honest about you know, what you publicly say versus what you really think. And that cognitive dissonance, that gap between intention and actual action. And then four is about actions. What are you going to do? OK, so you said this, but this is what you do. How are you going to walk the talk? And making it a personal leadership work to reduce that gap, to reduce that cognitive dissonance bef between what you say and what you do. And I think if companies do this conscious stuff and do this unconscious stuff, we've seen the kind of step changes that can be made in, in diversity inclusion in, in tech organizations. Mm -hmm. And what do you think about um, <coughs> binding quotas or other recipes that the government might impose on industry, Sean? Do you think that's a good thing to start with? You know, I think that intentionality is a really important piece here. And, you know, for instance, at National Geographic, we've set our own goals around where we want to be in diversity, not just of our teams at headquarters, but who we're funding out there in the world as well. And it's a, you know, a rich tapestry of talent that we have assembled. But it really happened because we said, we're going to make it happen, OK? Mm -hmm. And when we talked about the leadership point, I completely agree it's important. But I would also add at the board level, because I can tell you the number of boards I've sat on through the years as the only woman. And I could see around corners they couldn't just because I bring a dis different perspective, much as they could see around corners I couldn't because they see the world differently than I do. But what we're seeing is in firms, much of the data Shelley was talking about, in firms where there's even one female board member, it makes a difference in what you see in the layers below, who makes it into senior management, how then that influences the practices more broadly. So. You know, I but how, how big is really the influence a woman has if she's a single one in the board? Does, can I she think really it's change huge. the culture? I think yeah? it's been huge. I have absolutely no doubt that as the only woman on several boards I've sat in in the past, it made a very big difference. Because and I would say not just because I am who I am. I'm saying if you pluck someone who has talent and put them into you know, a mixing bowl with others, better stuff is going to happen because now you literally remove your blind spots because mm -hmm. someone's got each piece of the picture if they're sitting around the table. 
Mm-hmm. And um, let's Can come add to uh, that. Also, some of the things from an investor's point yeah. of view that um, you know we're we're looking at uh, opportunities for where can we uh, unleash capital that is missing now from the capital sources for women in particular. And uh, you know everybody talks about venture, and we know the issues on venture. But really, there are many other sources, a full range of capital. I just want to Absolutely. name three thoughts. One, one is grants, and women who start businesses often don't look at that full spectrum of capital opportunities. And I want to name, since I'm the president of the uh, North American Jury for Cartier, and I've been involved with them for over a decade, we, we have over the years gotten Cartier to really step it up. And very few people realize Cartier gives out a million dollars a year in grant money to women founders from all over the world, the largest business plan competition um, in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and identifies extraordinary women innovators who then, some of us, then go on to fund as well for for other follow-on funding. Um, Secondly, banking. So Global Banking Alliance for Women, of which I'm proud to be on the board, we have now mobilized many of the world's top financial institutions, Westpac in Australia, largest bank in Australia, Itau in Latin America, largest bank in Latin America, Royal Bank of Scotland, NatWest in the UK and Europe, and many others I can name in the MENA region, virtually Asia, all, every region of the world. Starting to tap, you know, we talk about 10% venture capital, the full amount f- of, of bank loans that goes to women-owned businesses is 4%, 4 of bank loans. We are trying to change that in a massive way. Unleashing institutional capital is critical. And then building on that, uh, the World Bank, working with the World Bank on their uh, big global fund for women. And last but not least, and this is the one I most love, because I think nobody thinks about this, nobody talks about this. We are currently living through the largest transfer of wealth we will be seeing in our lifetimes. Um, And women will be, 75% 75% of the recipients of those trillions of dollars of, of wealth creation, oh, wealth transfer, sorry. So not wealth creation, but wealth transfer, because w- inheriting from both their parents as millennials for the most part, and their husbands, since women generally outlive men. And I think we have a unique opportunity in time now to create a movement, to start moving some of this capital to start, because what we do find with women investors, especially those who inherit a million or more, is that they have entirely different values and approaches to investment than their husbands. 62% change their financial advisor within a a year or plus. Um, And so this is a huge opportunity, I think, to start, you know, elevating the story and start providing opportunities for women to invest and supporting other women. Mm. I think we have um, pointed out some really big challenges um, from our topic as the time is uh, running. I'd like to finish um, the debate with a positive aspect. Um, what makes, what elements make you bullish about more inclusive entrepreneurship? Do you want to start off? Sure. I think I, I think what's what's positive is that leaders all over the world are waking up to the fact that diversity is not just the right thing to do, but the smart thing to do. As Shelley was saying, um, Intel's Dauber. Uh, report earlier this year that found that every uh, 1% increase in diversity led to 3% increases Mm -hmm. in revenue, I think was really a a turning point for corporate leaders um, to have such a a large tech giant uh, really put a stake in the ground and say, we're going to care about this and try and make progress. So I'm I'm generally optimistic that we're on the right side of history. (coughs) It's always going to take longer than you want it to, um, Mm -hmm. but I think... um, as a man and as a white man who has a lot of power um, in in the system, um, it's important to to be an ally and to speak up and to put yourself out there uh, to advocate for women and, and those who don't have the same place. Steve Woodward, what's your pick, Anna? So I, I'm a relentless optimist. Um, look, diversity is a reality, right? People who don't have a who have a hard time like getting that or trying to sell diversity. I mean, look out the window, right? Diversity is a reality. But it's inclusion that's a choice. And I'm really optimistic that actually, given the diversity of reality, people who aren't into it so much are not going to actually do very well. And actually, people who do choose you know, to include that diversity are doing well. And we're seeing that more and more and more through startups. We're seeing it through the performance and the failure of different Fortune 500 companies. And I think that diversity being a reality, but inclusion being a choice, is something we will see scaled up. And I, I look forward to more success examples going forward so that we can scale. 
Sean, we only have 30 seconds, but... Um, to be really fast. I would add to Shelley's really impressive list of things we're seeing out there and add the optimism that Steve talked about. You know, there are accelerators and incubators around the nation that are specifically focused on inclusive entrepreneurs, bringing more women in, bringing more people of color in. We're backing a lot of these. We're excited. Alternative funding that Shelley talked about, you know, and the Kickstarters of this world, women actually raise more money than men do. So there are lots of bright lights out there that are showing the way. And a policy framework, going back to your question, that basically says we'll make it beneficial for the investor to invest in these underinvested segments. So I'm very optimistic. So thank you for this positive uh, panel here. And I think the good aspect is also that this tech conference is one of the most diverse mm. in the world. So I hope even next year we have even more, fe more female speakers here. Great. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.